Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Rod Farrell? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, consider supporting me on Patreon, and check out my podcast, Bella Grande Media. I will put the relevant links in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Rod Farrell was born in Murray, Kentucky on March 28, 1980. Both his parents, Rick Farrell and Sandra Gibson, were 17 years old when Farrell was born. They tried living together, but only made it about a month. Farrell was raised by his mother. They lived with Gibson's parents much of the time. Gibson made a living as an exotic dancer and sex worker. Apparently, she had an interest in vampires and introduced her son to various fantasy role-playing games. Farrell became obsessed with one game specifically called Vampire the Masquerade. His interest in vampires would increase significantly as he grew older. Farrell did not perform well in school academically. It sounds as though he may have been bullied to some extent, but at the very least, he did not fit in well with his peers. In 1990, Sandra Gibson's parents bought a home in Eustis, Florida. Farrell and his mother moved from Kentucky to Florida temporarily. Farrell made several friends in Florida, who he missed when he would move back to Kentucky. One friend was a 15-year-old girl named Heather Wendorf. She complained that life with her parents was terrible. When Farrell moved back to Kentucky to start 10th grade, he called Heather Wendorf several times. The phone bills were so expensive that Farrell's mother could not afford to pay them. The phone line was cut off. Farrell started calling Collect. Heather's father put an end to that. According to Heather's sister, this made Heather very angry. Farrell and Heather Wendorf would keep their communications alive by writing letters. Farrell ran away a couple times and returned to Florida on his own. At one point, Farrell went to New Orleans with his grandparents. This trip made an impression on him. When he returned to Kentucky, friends said that he was more self-confident. He pretended that he had trained in martial arts and started dressing in black. He continued his interest in vampires, claiming to be a 500-year-old vampire. Farrell's performance in school declined even more. His teachers said that he was disrespectful. He refused to do his assignments and wouldn't pay attention in class. Between January and May 1996, he had accumulated 22 infractions of school regulations. He was expelled for the remainder of the year. They told him to return the spring semester of the following year. The official reason for his expulsion was willful disobedience, defiance of school authority, and incorrigible bad conduct. Even though he was forbidden from hanging around school, he continued to do so. At one point, the principal threw him off the property and reported his trespassing to the juvenile court system. Farrell started dating a 15-year-old girl named Charity Kessie. They both participated in Farrell's vampire fantasy. Rod Farrell started hanging around with other people who were also fascinated by the whole vampire theme that he was going with. Farrell became convinced that he was possessed and had no soul. He put up black curtains on the windows of his room. He and his friends would go to cemeteries at night, perform rituals involving blood, and engage in antisocial behavior. Farrell's mother became worried that Farrell would attack her. She involved the Department of Social Services, who expressed serious concerns about Rod Farrell's behavior. They referred him to receive treatment from mental health counselors. He only showed up for a couple of appointments. Farrell's mother filed a complaint with the juvenile court, saying that Farrell was beyond parental control, smoking marijuana, part of a satanic cult, staying out all night, and had threatened to kill her several times. Farrell appeared before a judge. He admitted to using not only marijuana, but also LSD and cocaine. Farrell took responsibility and pledged to change his behavior. He was turning over a new leaf. That day, he was going to move forward and no longer commit crimes. Several restrictions were placed on Farrell, including seeking mental health counseling treatment, submitting to drug screenings, abiding by a curfew of 10 p.m., and no threatening to kill people. Farrell's commitment to be a good citizen did not last long. He immediately started breaking the rules. One night not too long after this, 
He allegedly killed a stray kitten when he was out with one of his friends. In August of 1996, Farrell was attacked by an older friend named Stephen, who was arrested for assault. Stephen would eventually plead guilty and spend seven days in jail. It was this point that Farrell appeared to form his own gang. I guess, among other problems, he had concerns about his safety. This could be considered the beginning of his vampire clan or vampire cult. Members of Farrell's group would include Charity, his girlfriend, a 16-year-old named Howard Scott Anderson, a 19-year-old named Dana Cooper, and several other people, perhaps as many as 10 in total. Farrell considered Stephen the leader of a rival vampire cult. Farrell's mother, Sandra Gibson, was arrested for trying to entice Stephen's 14-year-old brother into having sex with her as some type of vampire ritual. Eventually, she would plead guilty. On October 14, 1996, Farrell and at least one other person allegedly broke into a county animal shelter and killed two puppies. They also let dozens of dogs out of their cages. The police suspected cult activity and were confident that Farrell was involved. Farrell's mother gave him an alibi to help him avoid being held responsible for that crime, but the police were actively pursuing Farrell as a suspect. It seems likely that if Farrell did not get involved in other crimes, which I'll talk about in a moment, he would have been arrested for this crime at the animal shelter. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. In November of 1996, Farrell, Howard Anderson, Dana Cooper, and Charity Kessie climbed into Anderson's Buick Skylark and drove to Eustis, Florida. Their mission was to pick up Heather Wendorf, thereby saving her from her parents, who again she felt were terrible. Farrell planned on taking everyone to New Orleans after that, where they could all live as a happy vampire family. Heather Wendorf claimed that she crossed over to becoming a vampire after drinking Farrell's blood at a cemetery in Florida. Farrell would later claim that he took LSD and drove to the Wendorf residence with the intention of stealing their light blue 1994 Ford Explorer. On or about November 25, 1996, Farrell and Anderson made entry into the Wendorf family home. It was occupied by 49-year-old Richard Wendorf and his 54-year-old wife, Ruth. Farrell and Anderson were able to get in through a garage door that was unlocked. When they were in the garage, Farrell found a crowbar. In the house, they encountered Richard asleep on the couch, and Farrell beat him with the crowbar. He broke his ribs and fractured his skull. Ultimately, Richard would die. Ruth discovered the intruders moments later. Farrell beat her to death with the crowbar. He would later claim that he did not intend on killing her, but she closed the distance and threw a hot cup of coffee on him. Farrell and Anderson drove off in the Ford Explorer. They also took some jewelry and a credit card. Heather's older sister, 17-year-old Jennifer, discovered their bodies on November 25, so the same day that they were murdered, after returning home from work at a supermarket. She called the police. The police arrived and found the grisly scene. They noticed that Wendor's body had a burn mark in the shape of a V. Murder warrants were issued for all five members of the vampire clan. Farrell, Anderson, Cooper, Kessie, and Wendorf made their way to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, although, as I mentioned, their ultimate destination was New Orleans. Heather Wendorf did not realize that her parents were killed until after the group was already on their trip to Louisiana. So, in theory, she was not part of the conspiracy to kill her parents. While on the journey, Charity called her mother, who in turn called the police. Charity's mother assisted the police by tricking the members of the cult to make their way to a Howard Johnson's hotel where the police were waiting. Upon arriving, the group was arrested. Later, they would be extradited to Florida. After his arrest, Farrell gave an interview during which he claimed he suffered from special blackout moments. After these happened, he would have no memory of what he had just done. I think these are also known as anti-conviction blackouts, they are common among criminals. Farrell claimed he had multiple personalities. He said a rival vampire cult committed the murders, and he said he didn't want to be a vampire anymore. I guess after 500 years of doing the same job, he was just a little bored in that occupation. On two separate occasions, a grand jury refused to indict Heather Wendorf. 
they determined she had no prior knowledge that the murders, robbery, or burglary would take place, even though some people had indicated she knew about the vehicle. So she knew that Farrell and Anderson wanted to take that Ford Explorer. Farrell pleaded guilty to two counts of felony murder on February 5, 1998, and was sentenced to death. He was the youngest person in the United States at that time to be put on death row. Later, his sentence would be reduced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Farrell said that Anderson was only an accessory, and the other people in the vampire cult were not guilty. Anderson pleaded guilty on April 1, 1998, and was sentenced to two life terms in prison to be served consecutively. Later, his sentence was reduced to 40 years. He will be eligible for release in 2031 when he is 51 years old. Dana Cooper and Charity Kessie both pleaded guilty to two counts of being principal to third-degree murder, armed robbery with a deadly weapon, and burglary with a deadly weapon. Dana was sentenced to 17 and a half years in prison. She was released in October of 2011. Charity only received 10 and a half years. She was released in March of 2006. Farrell had a resentencing hearing in April of 2020. His argument was that because he was a minor when he committed the crime, he shouldn't have to serve life in prison with no possibility of parole. A judge said that he was irreparably corrupt and upheld the sentence. Rod Farrell will never be released from prison. Now moving to my analysis. As far as the mental health factors that work with Rod Farrell, here's what the experts said at his trial. Farrell had schizotypal personality disorder and Asperger's syndrome, which is now referred to as autism spectrum disorder. He had a history of depression, used drugs, and had a learning disability. He was disconnected from reality. He began hearing voices of angels and devils as a young boy. I don't know what they were saying, but I guess the message from the devils resonated more with him. Farrell made claims that appeared to be delusional, like saying he could smell blood through walls, lift a 200-pound man with one hand, and killing made him feel like a god for a split second. Schizotypal personality disorder is characterized by ideas of reference, odd beliefs, magical thinking, odd speech, unusual perceptual disturbances, paranoia, inappropriate affect, peculiar behavior, a lack of close friends, and social anxiety. Having delusions is not a symptom of this disorder, and it is not associated with violence. In a way, we can think of schizotypal as being on a continuum with schizophrenia. Schizotypal is a cluster A personality disorder, along with paranoid and schizoid. So if we think about this continuum with schizophrenia, schizotypal would be the closest of those three personality disorders to schizophrenia. But again, there is no psychosis with schizotypal. There are symptoms that are right on the edge of psychosis. Autism spectrum disorder is characterized by deficits in social communication and restricted and repetitive types of behavior interests, or activities. It is also not associated with violence. What happened in this case? How did all these young people get involved with this serious crime? One theory is that they were truly in some type of cult, and Farrell was the cult leader. Like this whole thing with the vampires was an actual cult. Whatever type of vampire group Farrell formed, it was not a cult. Farrell did not fit the profile of a cult leader. He was not charming, charismatic, intelligent, or convincing. His group lacked many of the features that we typically see in cults. For example, there was no mind control, no communal goals. They did not target middle-class citizens. I guess one could argue that they did have a novel belief system, although calling it a system seems like giving it too much credit. Farrell's only consistent ideology was the idea that vampires, crime, and drugs were good. That's not really sophisticated enough to qualify as a cult. Farrell was very far away from being anything like Jim Jones, David Koresh, Bhagwan Rajneesh, or Marshall Applewhite. Farrell wasn't even up to the level of Amy Carlson from the Love Has One cult, and she really set the bar low for who qualifies as a cult leader. Even as a vampire, Rod Farrell was a failure. Farrell made Count Chocula look like Lestat from the movie Interview with the Vampire. I think what really happened here was that Farrell was an outcast, and his odd behavior was an attempt to form a new group where he could fit in. Farrell had a challenging upbringing, 
to say his mother was a negative influence is the understatement of the century, or perhaps the last five centuries, considering Farrell was a 500-year-old vampire. Farrell was accustomed to doing whatever he wanted. His rebellious and manipulative tactics allowed him to achieve his goals. By being antisocial, he was able to attract attention. Somebody cared about him. His poor impulse control and sadism made it easy for him to kill animals and ultimately people. Farrell's bizarre and destructive behavior attracted people who also felt like they were on the fringe of society and perhaps did not have much in the way of parental supervision. To them, he was exciting. He could free them from boredom and rules. This fascination with vampires was probably just because they were mysterious, antisocial, and outcasts themselves. You never see vampires winning good citizen awards, at least not outside of their vampire group. Farrell and his vampire clan were looking for some way to be novel, to create something they could believe in, a unifying ideology, a way to create an identity. These young people were going without leadership in their lives. They did not have a role model. They will accept just about anybody who they believe can fill that role, even a sadistic criminal who was obsessed with vampires. Those are my thoughts on the case of Rod Farrell. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.